Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone who have joined us from Israel. And good evening to everyone who have joined us from India. We welcome you all to the very first webinar from the series on EdTech on reimagining education and skill training, enabling innovation and entrepreneurship post COVID. We are very proud and pleased to mention that this webinar is jointly organized by India SME Forum, Israel Embassy and EdTech Israel. In today's webinar, we are going to know about the present ecosystem in the EdTech space in both the countries from our very learned and expert speakers who are present here today. We would also know about the business opportunities that exist from both the countries by the group of panelists and entrepreneurs. At the end of the webinar, we have also planned a B2B sessions with the five best Israel EdTech companies. So now I would like to actually welcome our host uh, for the webinar, Ms. Sushma Morthania. She's a co-founder and director general of India SME Forum and also managing director of Business Wise. And Ms. Natasha Zangin, who is a counselor, head of economic and commercial mission, Embassy of Israel, New Delhi. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much, Bhavya. A very good afternoon, very good evening to all of our dignitaries, speakers, esteemed panelists, and uh, lovely entrepreneurs, both from India and Israel, who've joined us uh, today. Uh, it's a great moment for me of pride and privilege both to host this first webinar on uh, reimagining education and skill. Um, it's, it's a very uh, interesting space close to my heart and we have planned a series of such webinars jointly with the Embassy of uh, Israel and EdTech Israel. So uh, welcoming you all for this. Um, 2020 might have been a tough year uh, for startups across India, but it was the year of being at the right place at the right time for India's EdTech companies. With the coronavirus pandemic and the subsequent lockdown that saw schools and colleges close their doors, online learning emerged as the next big thing to watch out for. India's biggest EdTech startups, Baiju's, Unacademy, Upgrad, Vedantu, and the likes saw their numbers multiply at a rapid pace and made some of them grow by 300% over the last year. So what has made EdTech such a hit? A confluence of factors has resulted in the recent EdTech ambush. From the perspective of students, EdTech fills in the gaps in traditional schooling such as lack of personalized tutoring and standardization. It has made it possible to blend innovative pedagogy with a model of scalable education services delivered at a low cost. Macroeconomic factors such as increased internet penetration and wide smartphone user base have created a conducive environment for the growth of edtech companies over the years. Growing disposable incomes offsets the cost of online education, making it affordable for India's middle income households. These factors have also bridged the accessibility gap through online learning modes. Finally, the need for a diverse skill set in the workplace makes the youth gravitate to platforms which provide such services on their personal devices. The COVID-19 phase has seen a tremendous rise in consumers of edtech. Homebound Indians who are in search of intellectually engaging paths invariably find a platform for their education needs. In the Indian context, big data and artificial intelligence are yet to establish their presence in the way education is delivered. As startups looking for new ways to attract users, a future in which state-of-the-art technology is the new normal in education doesn't seem too far away. This webinar series is programmed to encourage SMEs and startups in India 
collaborating with countries like Israel, who have done a lot of work in the field of edtech, which plays a key role in reshaping the educational strategies globally. This collaboration of India and Israel edtech has India SME Forum at the forefront with the support of the Israeli trade mission to India, Embassy of Israel. We are extremely thankful to Ms. Natasha Zengin and Mr. Kamal Rabha at the embassy, Dr. Yaki Dayan from EdTech Israel, and all the entrepreneurs uh, and esteemed uh, speakers and group of experts who have joined us today from Israel and India, both. And of course, uh, uh, our president, Mr. Vinod Kumar, and my team too. So we look forward to engaging with Israel for harnessing the opportunities which are there in the realm of ed tech for the thousands of Indian SMEs and startups dreaming of dominating this space. And today's webinar, webinar is just a first step forward in this direction. So uh, welcoming once again, all our members and viewers who have joined us today for this program, I wish you all the best and happy viewing and happy learning from today's webinar. So once again, welcome and uh, thanks again. Uh, over to you, Natasha. Thank you so much, Sushma. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, special thanks, of course, to our uh, dear partners from SME Forum, Mr. Kumar and Ms. Sushma. Uh, and our friends from Israel, um, EdTech Israel, Dr. Yaki Dayan, and of course, all entrepreneurs and panelists who are taking part in this session today. Um, you know, I won't be taking much of your time. I'm just here to say a very short welcoming words. Uh, and um, just on a personal note, I want to say that, um, you know, uh, at the trade mission in uh, New Delhi, uh, we focus on facilitating uh, economic cooperation between uh, Israeli ecosystem and Indian companies. Um, and uh, we deal daily with uh, cyber solutions, clean tech solutions, uh, um, automotive, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, being a mom, ed tech is, um, is close to my heart. And I think one of the few advantages that uh, the pandemic has brought um, into our doorstep is the fact that it's uh, um, provided a serious uh, push for the need for ed tech solutions. So I'm, I'm really uh, pleased that uh, at least we got that out of the pandemic. Um, so I'm, I'm very thrilled that uh, we collaborate with you today and that we have the chance to hear our panelists and to present uh, ed tech solutions coming from Israel, if it's uh, social and collective learning, if it's special needs education, if it's training, uh, if it's coding, STEM and robotics, or children online safety, uh, parents engagement, um, this is all uh, only examples for solutions coming from the ad tech ecosystem in Israel. And um, I wish uh, us all a pleasant and uh, um, fruitful event. And uh, special thanks, of course, to uh, Kamal Rabah from uh, our team who worked meticulously uh, at the background of this event and um, made it happen. And um, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. Uh, now we'll move to another session. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Amy Moyen, who is the president at Efeka Tel Aviv Academic College of Engineering, and Dr. Yaki Dayan, founder and CEO, EdTech Israel, and founder and producer, IES, Israel Education Summit. Welcome, sir. Professor Amy Moyal uh, has been the president of Efeka Tel Aviv Academic College of Engineering since 2014. And prior to his election, he founded and led the Efeka Center for Language Processing and headed the Department of Electrical Engineering. Before joining Efeka, Professor Moyal was active in the speech processing high-tech industry for 15 years and held various positions. He's carrying out his vision to transform engineering education and ensure the workforce readiness of Efeka graduates. Dr. Yaki Dayan, he is an edtech visionary, 
ecosystem builder and a recognized expert in education innovation and entrepreneurship he founded edtech israel in 2014 with the vision to transform startup nation to edtech nation edtech israel is a nation wide unbiased independent social impact business that successfully connects the israeli ecosystem with the international markets i welcome you both sir over to you sir thank you very much uh I was not expecting this uh, long introduction, so uh, thank you very much for the kind words. And uh, it is my uh, honor and privilege to uh, be interviewing, or let's say, having a conversation with a dear friend, with uh, uh, Mr. Ami Muyal. Uh, Professor Ami Muyal, is it okay if I call you Ami? Yes, definitely. <laughs> thank you. So uh, I know that, uh, first of all, I understand that you are already six years in your position. Yeah. Time travels fast. Nice. <laughs> and uh, interesting that we are all dreaming about transforming, transforming the ecosystem, transforming the, the, the institute. And I know that you had a lot of visions to transform Africa. Those visions that we discussed were put, put, before COVID. Yeah. Now, small virus came and changed the entire world. How can you maybe relate to how COVID changed or affected your vision and your way to transform the, the, the Africa Engineering College? Thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me to participate in this uh, important uh, uh, event. I strongly believe that we are living in a world of uncertainty and no one of us knows what is the real solution. <clears throat> so I strongly believe in a collaborative learning, a joint learning at all levels, government, states, institutes. So uh, I'm happy to be here and to share our insights. And beside of it, on a personal note, I strongly, strongly believe that education is the mo is our most important role as a society. So this is definitely a first priority topic uh, from my point of view, and I'm happy to be here. I I'll try to, to split my answer to a strategic level, how, how I see engineering education, what we did before the coronavirus and how the coronavirus changed our plans, but it changed our plans on a implementation level, the goal still stays the same. If we are looking at the industry all around the world, specifically the high-tech industry, in recent years, there's a growing demand for skills for our graduate, for engineering graduates, specifically soft skills like uh, uh, multidisciplinary teamwork, self-learning, critical and innovative uh, thinking, and even effective communication skills. We can see in Israel that although there, there, are, there is a great lack of engineers, still juniors with inexperience are facing difficulty to find their first job. In the past, we call it inexperienced engineers, but now we are beginning to use a different terminology of skills gap, because there's a difference between what industry is expecting and what is the profile of the graduates that are coming from a academic institute, which, I, which was more focused on knowledge rather than on skills. Having this in mind, we decided at AFECA, and indeed you recall about six years ago, we have started a process that I will try to describe the main highlights of it. That first of all, we decided that we need to be in connection with the education system and the industry and to build a, a, a joint ecosystem, taking a look at the whole education continuum. Secondly, we decided that since our main role is to train engineers and the vast majority of them are going to work in the high-tech industry, we must, we must discuss with the industry and to train engineers according to industry needs. That has led us to do something that is quite unique and I'm talking about it in many conferences, we have decided not to analyze the academic process and rather to define the profile of the graduate. 
as an outcome that the whole system would work towards it. It's more of a, like developing a product in the high-tech industry rather than analyzing the, the process, defining the, uh, the product itself. It took us more than a year. We traveled to universities in the States. We talked with industry all around Europe, state, and Israel. And to summarize a long process, we have defined the profile of the graduate of FECA. Scientific knowledge, engineering knowledge, skills, as I mentioned earlier, engineering skills, languages, Hebrew, English, software as basic languages, ethics, and broad knowledge, meaning a completely different model of an engineer than I've studied more than 20 years ago when I received mainly knowledge. So this is on the strategic level. On practical level, in the last four years, it took us about two years to do the definition, the strategy, and the definition of the profile. In the last four years, we are working in several par parallel paths on doing a real transformation of engineering education in order to fit this profile. And shortly, I will describe the path. One, we have completely changed the curriculum. But the main thing that we did in the curriculum is that we inserted into the learning outcome of the courses, not only knowledge, skills, meaning learning outcome of a course can be, you need to know how to solve an equation, but you need to know how to give an effective, effective presentation in three minutes of English of a project. And then we added extracurricular activity, hundreds of students working in dozens of clubs, as not in courses. Third, we are uh, encouraging relevant pedagogy. In the past, I used the word terms new, innovative, but today I think that each course should fit the relevant pedagogy, pedagogy in order to, to get the learning outcomes. It can be project-based learning, flipped classes, gamification, hands-on, visiting industry. We have dozens of courses working not in a frontal uh, teaching, we have completely renovated the learning, teaching, and working spaces. You came to visit us, Yaki. Um, it looks like in high tech. Uh, everything is open spaces, no rooms. Everybody got laptops, building an environment of an atmosphere. And one last point is we understood that we cannot do it by ourselves. So we have built an ecosystem around the FECA, industry, hospital, government, Ministry of Education, NGOs, all working together. Our students are doing projects outside and some kind of a collaborative learning, as I mentioned earlier. One last point, this cannot be done without building a culture that encourage innovation and accept failure in the process as part of it, like I've learned in the high tech industry. Failure is only one step in improvement and going forward. So this is the shortest way I could describe the transformation that we have done in last years. And I will refer to the point of the corona. Ami, mean, before you go on and you refer to the corona uh, crisis itself, uh, I, I wanted to touch a little bit, uh, you mentioned the, the, a new culture between and that is not only ecosystem but also new culture for the students yeah and now uh last year was very challenging uh but me as following uh, activities by feca it looks like every week you had another reason to celebrate <laughs> <laughs> every week another challenge another something to give to the students to solve a lot of uh, engagement and, and challenging them to solve things that were all related to the crisis, because we know that you cannot learn applied engineering by Zoom. So can you yeah. refer with me to this and to the last year of COVID, how it affected you? Yeah, excellent question, because we have, uh, prior to the coronavirus, we built here a, a wonderful environment and, and uh, adventure for the students. In my belief, students should come at eight o'clock to the campus until midnight. Teaching classes, clubs, innovative center, international competition, hearing a lecture. And that was the situation prior to the coronavirus. And then in 48 hours, we went suddenly at, uh, to 
I'm not, I'm not even calling it online learning, Rem distant learning, okay? The, the pedagogy was not transformed in the right way. So it, although the target remains the same, all the tools that we had uh, uh, vanished at, uh, at, at a day or two. So actually what we did with a lot of thinking and a lot of work, we did several steps that I would, would like to describe in a high level. First of all, we built a completely virtual campus. We took any class, any lab, any meeting room, library, assigned a commercial Zoom uh, license, and then student, faculty, and work workers uh, worked in the in the virtual campus. Then we had a problem with labs. I agree with you. With when you train engineers, you need labs in a physical level in discussions. For several weeks, we were forced to move to the Zoom. Part of the labs were closed, and then we developed very fast kits that we delivered to the students at home. Once we time, we receive an approval for capsules, so we split the labs into half of the students at lab and half at home. Another point, we estimate that we are going to move to a hybrid model. We equipped all our classes and labs with areas of cameras, microphones, and, and notebooks, a lot of technology. I don't want to describe all of the items in order to build a collaborative learning environment while part of the students are at home and part of the students are at class. So this was completed and running the whole first semester. And to the point you have mentioned, extracurricular activity from my point of view is very important. Energy, curiosity, students are coming to learn not because they're receiving credits, because they want it. And then we've built a lot of challenges on a weekly basis, try to relate them to problems that the coronavirus uh, has put on our table. And there was a lot of work, online, hybrid, in campus, on projects with the community, and I will describe with your permission only one, and I was involved in it personally. I'm an expert in speech recognition, and we have quite a large research center that is dealing with speech processing. The government has approached us with a nice project to see if we can identify potential carriers of the coronavirus by analyzing the voice, the coughing, or even the breath. So in the last year, we have quite a large project by the government and that enabled cooperation with various countries, Cambridge, universities in Europe, a lot of students, faculty. So we took advantage of the challenges that the project, the coronavirus has put on the table in order to put them in facing for our students and faculty to handle real world problems and try to assist our society handling uh, the crisis that we are facing. So, uh, you know, we definitely in a new normal. We definitely now in a new situation. We are not going to go back to 2019. Uh, the, the world has changed in so many ways. There are a lot of discussions about hybrid models, you know, but it, everyone, at the more that I speak with people about hybrid models, everyone has its own definition of hybrid yeah. and a different vision of hybrid. What are the best insights that you have learned so far that will shape the way that AFECA will continue as a hybrid campus for the future? Okay, so I'm very happy that you said so far because myself and the whole team are learning on a daily basis and we should adapt to it. Learning on a daily basis. I, I, I want to divide my insight into two groups. One is on a strategic level, and secondly is on an operational level. First of all, on a, on a strategic level, we have seen that although I strongly believe that there should be a, a transformation of the whole education continuum from kindergarten to the academia, and I'm talking about it for many years. This crisis has showed us when there is an imminent threat on our work, a change can be done immediately, meaning that any change can be done. And this is what I'm telling to my management. No more discussion or hesitation with regard to possibility of doing a change. We have all shown together 
that if we want and we have enough motivation, any kind of change can be done. And this is very important on a strategic level when handling resistance in the future for doing a, a change. Secondly, I fully agree with you. We will not go back post-corona, and I don't know when is post-corona, it's a general term, to the situation that we entered the corona. No way. We have been taken to distant learning using digital, and I strongly believe in the next few points. One, and I'm not referring to online. I'm referring to a general term, and I'm not talking about hybrid teaching. My concept is a hybrid campus. I think that teaching, learning, research, innovation, innovating center, extracurricular activity, services to the students will all change from a physical to a certain point that is hybrid, a complete change in all our activities, even the work of the administrative uh, level. And I strongly believe that each institute will have to choose the working point that fits his strategy and his goals or even uh, the learning outcomes. And for example, I, I'm not saying that we are shifting to online. What we had at FECA on a physical level was great. I think that we should take from the experience, from the online, from the di di digital, all the things that are not replacing, enhancing. I see it as an enhancing process. And I will give an example. We have established here uh, joint virtual groups of students that are learning together because they learned from home, they were alone, and, and that and, and uh, it was a nice response from the students to it. Every day, 10 or 12 different groups on different hours of student learning together with a tutor. Even if we'll go back to the physical campus, virtual communities, great faculty, students, faculty and students could and so there are several technical things or a platform that we have built that are going to remain with us. I strongly believe in interaction between students, definitely in engineering, because I believe in collaborative innovation. Nobody can do the innovation by himself. There's a, a lot of value in uh, collaborative. I believe in enhancement of taking from the digital and online world, what can enhance our uh, experience. We need to finish soon. So I would like maybe to ask a very direct and specific question. How can AFECA collaborate and work with institutes in India in order to facilitate a knowledge transfer, knowledge sharing, and uh, doing some, I don't know, a shared project or shared learning uh, from now on? Okay, first of all, we will be more than happy to cooperate as, uh, between nations and to have a, a platform for uh, learning together. But I want to put on the table, uh, our approach is different. We have moved to defining the profile of the graduate and synchronized everything according to it on a strategic plan, and we have built an ecosystem. I will be more than happy to share our insight experience with partners in India and to assist in establishing a similar ecosystem in India of industry, academia, SMEs, government. And one, once such an ecosystem would be established around engineering education, that should be a dream that the two ecosystems, the one that we have built here, will work with the ecosystem in India in all paths, exchanging students, faculty, uh, talking about learning outcomes, joint research, at all areas of activities, or sharing knowledge in order to gain fastest to the, to the right solution, uh, but also to do things together. Hybrid model, we can have joint courses, half of them from India and half of them from Israel, and uh, a lecture either from here or from the Institute in, in India, meaning a real collaboration. 
I'll be more than happy to, to be involved in such an activity. It would be a drive for change locally and between the two nations. Well, uh, it's really a challenge. Uh, we are welcome. We are eager to take this challenge and uh, take it forward. I want to thank you very much, uh, Professor Ami Moyal, for your time. Thank you and, very much. Uh, I feel that we could have probably discussed it for hours, but we, mm -hmm. <laughs> we need to uh, give the stage to uh, our next uh, uh, moderator, Mr. Vidal Kumar, and the panel discussion. So thank you very much, uh, Ami Moyal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll be move ahead for our panel discussion which will be followed by the pitch session and the B2B meetings. So uh, now we are heading to a panel discussion, which will be on reimagining EdTech after COVID-19. Uh, I would like to welcome all our panelists, starting with Ms. Mikhail Avni. She's a co-founder, CEO at Symbolab, AI for math education, serving 100 plus million students worldwide recently acquired by Course Hero. She is an entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience in innovation, research, and technology formulation. She is a former head of Religions IL, a pioneer in real-time search. And she has built this and innovation teams from the ground up leading to a successful acquisition by AOL in 2006. Mikhail is recognized and is expert in the field of AI, and she holds a BSc in mathematics and computer science from Tel Aviv University. Welcome, Mikhail. Thank you. We have with us Ms. Anath Defo, member of NISET and manager at Mobile Eye. She is a social entrepreneur and high tech marketing expert, member of NISET, which is also the Israeli parliament. Anath's public activities are education focused. She's a chairperson of Yesh Atit's education board, deputy chairperson of Har Adar Council, and spokesperson of National Parents Association. She is passionate about making education a national goal, adding education nation title to the startup nation. Welcome, Anant. Now I would like to welcome Professor Mahadev Jaiswal, who is a director, Indian Institute of Management, Sambalpur. He is also the professor of information systems. Prior to this, he was a professor and dean at MDI Gurgaon. His qualifications include PGPX from MIT Sloan School of Management, USA, PhD in computer science from Delhi University, and senior Fulbright fellow from Carnegie Mellon University, US. He has been a visiting professor at IIM Ahmedabad and IIM Indore. His area of expertise includes innovation strategy for startups, digital innovation, and platform, platform ecosystems, social entrepreneurship, e-government, ERP, and IT strategy. Welcome, sir. Now I would like to welcome Mr. Krishna Singh. He's a first-generation entrepreneur thought leader, innovator, and team player. He started his entrepreneurial journey with Global Space Technologies Limited, which is listed on BSc as GSTL. His passion to innovate and the quest to challenge in the convention was the reason for initiation of entrepreneurial innings and building innovative business from scratch. Over the last 10 years, Krishna has extensively worked in health tech and edutech space with a mission to create a truly integrated digital ecosystem. He's a CMD and promoter of Global Space Technologies Limited. Welcome, sir. Now, I, this session would actually be uh, moderated by Mr. Vinod Kumar, who is the honorary president of India SME Forum. He started out as a technology entrepreneur to lead the development and successful sale of an indigenous developed navigation and geographic information system based tracking patent and business to a Russian space and GIS conglomerate. As an investor, he presently invests in profitable, innovative, small and medium companies, supervises and mentors investments of over $135 million 
apart from mentoring over 200 entrepreneurs across various sectors. Mr. Kumar's experience in startups, seed, equity, and development financing and capacity building of MSMEs has successfully led him to innovative strategies in equity and growth capital investments in SMEs apart from the development of successful strategies for a nationwide capacity building framework at the India SME Forum in the capacity of its honorary president. I welcome you, sir, and I welcome all the panelists here. Thank you very much, Bhavya. I would uh, request uh, our friend, uh, uh, you know, um, we've been talking about the fact that, you know, I would love uh, for Yaki to be also there to moderate this panel because he understands the Israeli uh, uh, speakers very well. So Yaki, I'm sure you're up for it. You know, uh, I will ask questions, the Indian speakers, and you will ask the, the Israeli speakers the questions. <laughs> well, there's a lot of questions coming in from the audience. So I'd love that. You know, I, they're already, uh, so friends, uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to uh, pose any questions to any of the panelists, any of the speakers here, and we will try and get answers for you. I'm, I'm trying to see some of those uh, questions from the chat also. But while we talk to uh, our panelists, we will keep an eye out for your questions so that we ensure that you are able to take away from this webinar exactly what you need uh, to, to move to the next level. So, uh, you know, as an introduction, I'd like to, uh, for, for, for um, you know, uh, the, the idea of uh, our panelists from Israel, I'd like to talk about the fact that today, you know, we were talking about, uh, the Indian uh, EdTech market to be around uh, $750 million uh, uh, two years back. And today, you know, uh, the Bloom Ventures report has actually tagged us at a market which is going to be over $4 billion by 2025. So that's the si size of the market that we are looking at. Also, if, you, if we understand the new uh, national education policy of 2020, uh, reflected a certain emergence of edtech into the spotlight by st stressing the importance of leveraging technology in education solutions. And thereafter, you had the uh, COVID pandemic. I myself am an investor in one uh, edtech venture, and I'm longing to take it to the next level. And we are all gung ho about it. So I'm going to learn from all of you that have, that have already been there and done it. So um, with that, you know, uh, we also understand that uh, Indian edtech startups have raised over $2.2 billion in funding in 2020 itself during the COVID era. So that in, in included, if we understand, let's say, for example, Baiju's uh, acquired Topper, uh, then uh, Lido was acquired by Temasek for $30 million. You had Instasolve. Um, uh, uh, as uh, acquired by Vedantu. Uh, you, we also had um, uh, Tap, Tap Chef uh, uh, acquired by an academy at a 100 crore valuation. So there's so many things that have happened apart from the fact that a lot of these edtech startups in India have raised money um, from various uh, institutions around, institutions and venture uh, partners around the world. So we, what we are talking about here is a real big opportunity for all of us. And nobody understands opportunity more than Avni here. As the co-founder and CEO at Symbolab, she has today uh, a, a mind-boggling number of subscribers, 100 million plus. 200, so, that's the plus. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it changed to 200 million. So, Avni, you know, we would all like to understand from you, you know, uh, how you've gone from uh, a person who was basically, uh, uh, you know, heading, uh, I, I would say, innovation in religions. And from there, you decide that you want to set up your own unit. And the fact that now it's not, it was no longer just going to be about tech guiding and uh, strategization and all that, but was actually running your own startup. So how did you go from, uh, you know, an employee to, uh, obviously you are an expert in uh, artificial intelligence and 
mathematics and uh, you know all of that we understand all your background but you know this transition from uh, a person who is working for somebody else as the head of r and d uh, uh, and then from there you get on to a point where you say i'm going to now have my own edtech startup and that too i'm going to have uh, subscribers from all over the world even those markets that normally people like us you know uh, are, are very very we just had one company which is from india which is which is just trying to now get into the north american market but you've been there and done it so we'd like to understand from you you know what what made you do it in the first place sure i'll try to to answer this uh, first of all the previous company relegence i was also a co-founder and i was uh, heading the center in israel i was the ceo in israel so i was always i think an entrepreneur uh, after the first job i i moved to washington dc for to continue with my education a masters in uh, computer science and at the same time i started to work as an engineer and uh, it was so much more challenging the real world to me i found it much more challenging than the academic world because you can't uh, uh, make the results of a research uh, you can't fine tune it to your research it's the real world the users are not forgiving so uh, i left my um, degree and just uh, continued to, uh, with uh, as an engineer and after a few years because the uh, technology is always uh, was very fast and uh, the pace is insane and is changing uh, on a daily basis you always have to learn something talking about life along learning working in the high tech that's your reality and uh, just after a few years i felt that just growing as an engineer you have to start as a junior engineer and then engineer and then senior and team leader and i thought to myself well this is like the journey is too long uh, i can do uh, bigger things just coming as a, back then it was more a consultant than an, an uh, entrepreneur and i was just uh, working with different companies building algorithms building uh, different things for many years not like for a few weeks so i was always uh, feeling comfortable i think not uh lending a job but uh being more truth to myself in building things and uh, pushing uh, the limit i think that's the motivation it was never the money uh it was just uh the vision and what you can see, what you can do because sometimes in, in, as an employee there are jobs that are very challenging and very uh uh and you can really grow but sometimes you're bounded by the position although you can do uh, better and bigger things so i think if you are not afraid of change and you're not afraid of the unknown because there are there is a lot of unknown uh there is no reason to not to succeed excellent you know uh, uh we, we you know we why we all talk about the fact that you know entrepreneurs are risk takers and uh the the basic thing about business is that it's the business of risk so if you are able to manage that risk in your head you may be able to take a step forward and manage it thereafter but then you know setting up a company and then growing it to 200 million you know did yeah. you have an idea when you set it out that you know i'm going to have uh, math education as something that i'm going to just put out there and people are going to wrap it up so how did that happen no i think it that most of the success successful companies always have a pivot on the way uh you start with one thing and you end up in with a different thing uh because i'm coming from the search world and also my co-founders we actually started a company with a vision of a search uh tool search technology for math and science uh something like google for math and we aimed for the academy not for uh, school kids uh we started with that and uh we built like a really uh, impressive algorithm and the investors uh, thought it's great and we showed it to students in uh, universities and they thought it's great but 
from thinking it's great to using it, there is a huge difference. So <laughs> we saw that uh, there was no engagement because we knew that there is a problem with math, but this was a higher level math. So it wasn't the root of the problem. Sure. And uh, working with this and talking to people and uh, understanding the behavior of the users, we understood that the problem is, is deeper than what we thought. And what we're doing is not helpful at this time because the users really need the solution. We were returning the like uh, sites and videos and things are, uh, about the problems that they were searching. So we tried to return uh, search results with steps, but it wasn't the exact same problem. So with math, there is like an anxiety. It's like the user is blocked. It's not like history that you can talk yes. about or around the topic here. It's like, give me the answer. So once we, we figured that out, we changed, we didn't think that it's a pivot. We just changed the algorithms to answer the problems instead of searching the problem. So we just build the answers. And then we started with limits, that's like a high math. And it was just, we just saw the engagement right there. Uh, because before we got to that, it sounds like, oh yeah, we saw that it's not working, we changed it, but it's, it's not that simple because when we build something, you're attached to it emotionally, it's very hard. First, there were talks, we were talking, oh, the users, they don't know what they're doing. It's like, there is nothing like the users don't know what they're doing. Usually it's, we don't know what we're doing. So, but it takes time to understand that and to say, okay, enough is enough. We will do something else. And still, we didn't really think of ourselves as ed tech. And we didn't think that we're doing, because we're coming from math and science and education is something like it's, it's for other people it's teachers we're not uh, doing that although my, i have to say that my mom is a teacher she was a teacher for many many years but i was like no i'm not a teacher this is not really for me so uh, and then we built something uh, we we continued uh, to build for the higher uh, level of math and then we thought why are we building for higher level that's like the percentage of, of students learning math is so much smaller than all the school kids, high school and middle school that have to deal with math because it's mandatory worldwide. Yes. So we started like to go to like uh, simpler uh, topics and we just grew so fast uh, because we built it from, when we started to build it, it was very clear to us that we we're building it for the students, for the users. The whole concept was building steps that are helping the students solve the problem. So, uh, and during this, it was like really doing research, not just AI research, but also research on education and learning the problem and learning this whole uh, thing. And uh, we are so deep into education and it's, uh, it, it's actually not colliding. It goes hand with by hand, the algorithms and the understanding the problem. If you don't understand the problem, you can't succeed. The one thing that is so important to entrepreneurs, and we always learn it the hard way, is not to fall in love with your solution, but to fall in love with the problem. Yes, absolutely. And absolutely. You know, that I, I, I have a follow-up question there. When you were building this entire thing, did you build this keeping North America in mind? Or where, you know, when you were building it, was it just Israel-based and then you know sort of it it moved, got wings and it went went the other other way? No, we're when we're building uh, uh, because Israel the market is very, very uh, small. And the one thing that is very important is that education is changing uh, between cultures it's yes. although math is universal and the thought was that's going to be easy it's, it's universal it's universal language uh the way that it's thought it's very different between different cultures so we uh just kind of ignored the israeli market and the israeli schools and we aim directly to the u.s market uh, the one thing about Israel is because we live, it's not an island, but because uh, we don't have good relations or good enough relations with our neighbors, uh, we are 
kind of uh, living like in an island and Israelis uh, tend to travel a lot and to uh, learn the world and uh, we learn English and other languages. So our mindset is, is global and we, we aim directly to the US market. Excellent. So that was the key. You know, you built specifically for that market and then you, yes. you move forward from there. And now the fact that you are talking about, you were not looking at the Israeli market. So we have the privilege of having your member of parliament, Ms. Anath Nafo here. So I mean, my next question would go to her. Uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Nafo, and pleasure that you could join in. Uh, I'd like to ask you, so, you know, when you have a lot of innovators in Israel, and not many of them are actually looking at how to change, you know, apart from what uh, Professor uh, Moyal talked about, you know, in terms of education and training, you know, uh, when you have innovators like Avni there who are focusing on the North American market, how do you maintain the standard of education in Israel? And what is it that, you know, how, how, how were you looking at, you know, while you were heading the, uh, uh, you know, at, at the, as the member of the par parliament, you are also uh, uh, looking after uh, the the board, which is which is primarily looking after the education. You were also the spokesperson of the National uh, Parents Association there. So, uh, and you you have a goal of making you know education the primary thing, you know, uh, in Israel. So, how do you handle it without innovators actually looking inwards? Well. Um... Do you hear me well? Yes, yes, ma'am. Great. Well, my uh, small um, angle uh, of action is uh, as a social entrepreneur who is willing to go through tough politics as well in order to advance support and start up in the education and a whole re revolution in this field. Um, today, um, as a part of the Israeli parliament, I'm doing two things to maintain our um strength in this field one is to prepare the law of the national council in education which will start the revolution from my point of view in education in my country as um, we need to keep uh, um, our strength in this field and uh, the other that i'm setting uh, up a large movement that will make sure that politician uh, will not forget the, to promote the law even when I'm going back to my uh, career uh, in the startup. Uh, just to make a very, very big success in Israel, which calls Mobileye. Yes. Uh, Mobileye was uh, bought uh, by, Intel. by Intel for $15 billion yes. years ago. So I'm working there in the field of international marketing. And um, um, if we would like to, to keep our strength as a, um, as a country that uh, deals with a lot of startups, uh, um, um, how can I say, uh, the startup nation, uh, we have to keep our strength in education. From my point of view, education has an important role to play in uh, maintaining our relative advantage. And I'm here to allow startups in education as part of the whole world go through in order to, to keep this. So this is my two angles that I'm uh, dealing with these days. And you know, uh, uh, while you're going back to your job at Mobileye, um, what I'd like to ask you is, you know, um, you were spearheading this initiative, which was basically the National Council for Education Law. And uh, wherein you were saying that, you know, we, we are known as a startup nation, you know, with so many patents registered every year, year after year. From that, we want to convert Israel into an education nation. So uh, how, how has the process been and how has the progress been on that part? Well, I think that, uh, you know, we are a surviving, uh, we have to survive as a country. And we put uh, all the things about uh, our security in the, in the top national goal. Uh, I think that our national goal should be education because uh, in order to survive in this uh, innovating, innovative world, we have to keep 
um, our strength in, in education because education is what uh, preparing all uh, our engineers and uh, uh, the Nobel Prizes that we won. Everything starts and ends in education. And I think yes. if we're going to put national as uh, the first uh, role and the first um, um, national uh, agree, I think this will make us uh, for the long term still uh, also part of our uh, goal will be to be a national um, nation for education primarily. You know, for the benefit of all the attendees and all the audience, uh, I, I hold up a copy of the Startup Nation. So if you have not read it, please find one. It's available on all bookstands, including Amazon and all. I was uh, presented this one by the then Council General for uh, a Council for uh, Israel in Mumbai. I still have it, but I, I keep it very close to me. I've read it almost five, six times to figure out how to change our innovation <laughs> ecosystem in India. But the fact is, you know, we have uh, thousands of colleges, thousands of engineering colleges, thousands of graduate you know, uh, colleges churning out students. I, I, I would say over half a million uh, schools uh, and uh, at every level. You know, we, we are an education nation, you know, frankly speaking. So, you know, uh, and we have some eminent educationists, uh, you know, Professor Mahadev Jaiswal is here. He, he's been spare, spearheading um, uh, initiatives in management education in India for a very, very long time. I suggest, uh, 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 you know, maybe Yaki could uh, ask him about how we are faring on this, this front when, when it comes to education, you know, for India. Yeah. And that's where I think we need to find strengths to, you know, um, uh, look at what we can manage together as collaborations. Uh, well, with pleasure. Uh, well, I think that one, uh, key word that's repeat, that uh, both uh, Anat and Michal and Ami were repeating uh, constantly, and also it's mentioned in your book, is the word ecosystem. Uh, and it took Israel many years to develop this ecosystem. And my question would be, you know, uh, for management level, for management colleges, where you uh, take, and, and you, you're responsible for the next, uh, a, a, a level of uh, leaders and managers in your, uh, how you see innovation and transformation embedded in your ecosystem and is there any ways maybe to uh, enhance that? Okay. Good afternoon everyone and thanks. Uh, our so, so your, your voice is very low. Uh, is it so? Hello? Yes, now, now it's better, sir. All right, okay. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, sir, yes. Sir. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So, let me thank uh, our India SME Forum, Sri Binod Kumar and uh, his team for having organized this and, and, and uh, working with, uh, you know, Israeli <coughs> uh, groups and educationists. I think it is really a great honor for me to be here. Uh, answering to the questions, let me say that, and also the theme of this webinar is reimagining education and skill. I think, you know, there are three elements uh, in the entire ecosystems. The first one is a classroom where the teaching happens, whether it's management or engineering. The second one is a research that is a library or labs. And third one is the assimilations of this knowledge, which happens in the industry. In present systems are prior to COVID, all these three are, you know, not integrated seamlessly. Of course, it, some aspects integrated, but teaching happens in the class, research happens in the lab, and, you know, consumption happens in the industry, but they don't in, integrate together. I think post-COVID, the digital digitalization of the education is trying to integrate all these three together. And for that, 3M are required, and that is what we are experimenting here in terms of innovation. 3M in the, in the entire education systems. So that the first M is about new method. The new method is as for our new education policy in India, NEP 2020. We have to shift from 
teaching to learning and learning centric educations experiential educations so that is the one m that is a new method let me say and with that i think a lot of changes are likely to happen we are also experimenting that that we have experimented in terms of that we'll say that industry will sponsor the project so experience should come the second m is about new model what is new model as some of our israeli friend have talked about flip classroom the basic teaching happens online where students can learn from digital media and when they come to the class either offline or online they will do only live project problem solving so with that innovation which never happened in the class will happen in the class because unsolved problems from industry which is sponsored now online will be you know attempted inside the class with the use of theories propagated by the professor and students and professor and industry all three will work together to try to solve at least those problems that is called experimentation so the teaching in the new model will be flipped class and that is what i am sambalpur uh, we have already started experimenting the third m and that is called mode the first one is method model and mode the mode is not going to be offline or online it is going to be blended so something which require experience we will you know get into physical class or spiritual class and something which cannot be can be done online which should be happen online so the blended method the blended mode of the education will happen now how this is entire education systems is moving towards the new innovations and i am sure india will be this time i mean in this century india and some of the institutions are already started experimenting in management education as well as i am sure in engineering the entire education uh, which used to happen in the blackboard will now happen in the platform the platform means like most of the industries today if you see if you ask if you if you if you ask if, you, if i ask one question that tell me the five companies which you cannot survive without visiting that every day or every hour and answer will come facebook linkedin zoom and google microsoft amazon and all these company are platform companies okay so these companies which now is the new model or new uh, play, new method of the entire business is called platform based business same way education also i feel is shifting towards platform the platform means we all will have login we can login from anywhere right now we have login we will have education from anywhere based on our login and password we will work together from various part of the world and in single platform the entire education will happen that is the future and in that context lot of reskilling is required because existing methodology existing method existing model cannot be replicated there and therefore is reskilling of teachers reskilling of entire industry professionals because in the platform economy or platform educations or platform society we'll have to learn new skills that in this new skills means when we are talking what should be all contained in talking what should be all contained in writing and what because everything will be now transparent and therefore a small mistake can put you behind the bar and any violation of intellectual property right intellectual copyright so many things will be you know we cannot say that i have not done okay and therefore we'll have to relearn that what we should speak when we speak what is our content creation what is our replications whether we are violating any copyright in terms of sourcing the materials while distributing while in the online platforms all these things will required and what is important in this is that every content which are already created we don't have to come for that in the classroom that we can learn in the platform self so when we come to the platform for educations i think our focus will remain creation of content so earlier the focus was dissemination of content will shift partly towards creation of content and industry will also participate in this 
so i am i am seeing a great future in the coming times due to this entire platform and digitalization of educations that we will be whole world will get integrated like right now we are talking with israel as if we are all here and i am sure this can happen now anywhere in the world we can have all continent working together depending on our interest we don't have to go to our neighbor now to meet and discuss we will have to come to israel online or we to go to united states or we have to go to you know new zealand any countries and we can find out what is our common interest and we can work and solve together i think the great future is platform educations platform based educations where integration of teaching research and assimilations of innovations of industry will happen together i am sambalpur is one of the premium brand of i am in india which is management educations we have already started experimenting today uh, even during pandemic time and post pandemic we have made our all classroom smart classroom and very soon we are starting the entire pedagogy of education not going to be case based we are creating a documentaries for educations every problems we want to make a movie so we are asking our students to be creative and write a script first about the problem and then conduct interview and make a movie and launch it in netflix and that is the model of educations which we are propagating at i am sambalpur and i'll be very happy to work with all of you thank you very much thank you sir well, you know, in fact uh, that that yaki you know it brings me to another question you know we just talked about practical and there's also a question here on the q and a which asks about you know what are the methods used to uh, uh, implement practical learning and is that uh, what is going to be the future of early childhood education is it going to be online offline or this again going to be this hybrid thing and krishna here has done some amazing work he he started uh, a company called makebot robotics uh, apart from his other companies and he is into robotics education so i wanted to ask him what have you oh, done yes. during this covid period where there was no practical education possible so krishna <laughs> so i think thanks vinod sir and thanks india sme forum for uh, this opportunity so i am krishna singh and uh, basically uh, this has been a very very interesting times if i can say and uh, i thought i must give one practical experience which we Uh, faced uh, pre covid i would say and uh, post covid so as uh, vinod rightly said that we are in a space of steam education wherein we used to set up robotics and ai lab in schools and then uh, students would come over and experience it and then learn uh, coding robotics and ai that was the business which we were in and then um, uh, those days we had a very big challenge uh, which was to um, have the classroom teachers because ultimately you could set up the lab you could have the content you could have the platform but ultimately every school would require a teacher to be physically present in the school and uh, uh, we we kind of proposed online model and uh, we were very politely refused across i mean we didn't had a single school which we which agreed ki okay we can get on to a digital mode of teaching and my teachers can uh, remotely teach uh, the students and uh, then we were in covid and believe me schools chased us that how many online sessions you could take and today 100% of our business is happening online so what i see is i'll tell you there there is a very interesting learning which we had of course schools being school and there is a conventional method of working that was going on but i think fundamentally there's been a behavioral change at i would say human level as a as this pandemic has done uh, i mean frankly i could never imagine doing 90% of my meetings online there was always a urge to meet physically and do the meeting that today 90 to 95% is happening on some or other digital platform i think same way the end consumer now has learned that this is the way of life and this is fairly efficient it may have some uh, shortcomings but at the end of the day this is working and that concept has been established so typically if i look at it from a behavioral science perspective it's like uh, you're forced to learn it i mean if the same thing as an education company or edtech company would have gone and said hey 
you come online and then learn, probably it would have taken us 10 years. My other company is in health tech business and we have online platform for doctors. There also, DocXR, we, we were just pushing people to come over and then suddenly pandemic forced the entire population to come over there. So I think this is one major paradigm shift which has happened in the industry and we are quite experiencing it. I, I think as far as edtech is concerned, uh, today uh, it's not just the virtual or the digital part which is like getting that traction. I think we are in the midst of pandemic and we see one of our competitors whom we thought to be smaller than us gets acquired for $300 million. Uh, I think you would all know about White Hat Junior. And we say, hey, this industry is suddenly looking to be such a big industry. And suddenly we realize that I think apart from the mode of communication or the mode of teaching, I think the importance of technology in education is suddenly understood and people are really talking about it. And then we have this new education policy also coming over. So I think overall, uh, the way I look at it, what was to happen over a period of next 10 years, the pandemic has uh, preponed it. And then we have all learned to maybe live this way. And uh, this is something I would say it's a very abrupt and a sudden change which has happened in the whole ecosystem. So once again, I really uh, am enjoying this whole discussion and <laughs> deliberations. But yes, I think there's a lot one can learn from each other and great learning session which is happening right now. Thank you. Thank you. Yaki, any, your questions? Uh, yes, Krishna, I'd like to ask you as an entrepreneur. You know, uh, there is one thing that separates entrepreneurs in India from entrepreneurs in Israel. One key thing that Michal discussed about. In Israel, we never start by creating a solution for our own market. That's the, the Israeli DNA is always to start something for the international market. Now, this is different because India, US entrepreneur, India is big. That's your market and you can grow over there and you can supplement the market. How do you see this, uh, I would say, how can we blend those DNAs? So entrepreneurs, like you from India and the Punas from Israel can learn from each other so they can be successful. Israel is the entrepreneurs successful in India, but maybe also entrepreneurs from India are successful in international markets. How can you make this happen? So I think in short, what you are saying is jointly, how can we rule the world? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's definitely a complementing uh, mindset. I think in your earlier deliberation, you did mention uh, one of the respected speakers from Israel. You did mention that uh, when you start thinking, you start thinking global. So as a mindset, Israelis are uh, global. In it, to one of those global economies rather than creating a global solution. But I think, but I think Krishna, uh, Krishna, fundamentally- we a, Krishna, we lost a couple of sentences. So please start the sentence again. We lost- I'm sorry. important you were saying. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is that I think in the initial deliberation itself, it came out that in Israel, when you are thinking you have a global mindset, wherein you think about clear creating a global solution, probably because the market there is a relatively smaller one. And I think genetically you are kind of predisposed to think global. When it comes to in India, uh, I think as an entrepreneur, uh, there are two things you start thinking. First, how do I quickly get my product into the market? And I think there is a market which is available in the uh, domestic and you think that why not go and exploit that market? Probably it works cheaper to explore these markets and that's the perception, that's the mindset. Unfortunately, when we think global, we think of migrating global, which is probably not right. And I think that whole mindset need to change as an entrepreneur, but I think there are a lot of new startups where thinking starts global. Like in one of our verticals, we are thinking global and we have already, I think you'd be surprised to know MakeBot. We already have seven partners. We are there in Australia, we are there in uh, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia. So those things are happening. I think it is all about uh, maybe having that soul mindset. Secondly, the technology again is helping. Like we are having this discussion we are engaging 
uh, remotely uh, with Israel uh, counterparts and maybe global uh, companies. And that's where the entire mindset shift can happen. But I think I see a great collaboration possibilities there, wherein I, I think jointly there, there are inherent strengths which Indian entrepreneur brings on the table. Probably by nature, uh, we would be uh, quite, quite uh, innovative, uh, risk first, and we, we understand the core entrepreneurship uh, as a proposition. And definitely with the global thinking, one can really create solutions which could be a, a truly global level solution and explore the global market. I definitely see that possibility happen. In fact, I agree completely, Yaki, with uh, Krishna. You know, it is, uh, we, we have a certain uh, way with the soft skills, soft skill training. We also have a certain way with, uh, you know, as uh, outsourcing partners, we have a lot of people that are trained in the right manner. But what I think is required is that global perspective that uh, you can bring in. And that, that would be key to looking at much, much larger, much, much broader markets, just not the Indian market per se, which would automatically mean that whatever we are developing would translate into products for the Indian market also. At the same time, it would also create a mechanism for Indian entrepreneurs to actually view the entire world as a market and not just a place A or a place B. And you, uh, uh, as far as Israeli uh, companies are concerned, you already have a space in the world, uh, you know, innovation uh, blackboard. So everybody understands what, what it's about. You have, you know how to get your foot into the door uh, as far as investor, investors are concerned, marketers are concerned. And that is precisely what uh, my feeling is uh, would be required. A, developing products together with sensitization for global markets and marrying these Indian entrepreneurs from India that have the potential. You know, like I was start talking about, you know, even as, a, as an entrepreneur myself, as an investor myself, I'd love to pit two or three companies from India with uh, two or three uh, companies from Israel and get them to work together on creating products for a truly global market, including Krishna's. You know, he, he has an amazing product fit, and that is a fit for the entire world. You know, in fact, I completely also agree with Professor Moyal when he said that when we are looking